A few times in our lives, we likely stand at the crossroad of what we know to be true and what others demand. Welcome to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. And we're standing at that crossroad today with Pontius Pilate, looking at Jesus on trial before a crowd demanding his death, yet knowing he was an innocent man. This was the most important moment in Pilate's life. We'll find out how he handled it in our study today. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you're investing your time in the study of God's Word. So if you can, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 27 as I read a letter from the Bible bus. This one is from a Zulu listener in Southern Africa. Here's what he says. You were doing the book of Judges when I received Jesus as my Savior. Friends and other people laughed at me and told me it wouldn't last. I am writing to tell you that this is my eighth year and I am growing in the things of the Lord. Man, isn't that great? Isn't that a great word of encouragement? Do our studies help you walk with the Lord? Well, why don't you share your story with us? We'd really love to hear about it. So please, be in contact with us. You can write to BibleBus at ttb.org, or you can always write the old-fashioned way with a stamp on that envelope to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. If you listen in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1 is the address to write. Let's pray for each other as we begin our study. Father, we're so grateful for your word in our lives today. We're grateful that it grows us, that it changes us, and it brings many more into a personal relationship with you. How wonderful is that? And that's our desire, Lord, to know you better and to walk with you more closely. So thank you for this opportunity to do just that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Our study today brings us to the 27th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And if you have your Bible and we'll turn there, we'll begin there in just a moment. I trust that you have our notes before you also. Now we saw last time these events that were the final events in the life of the Lord Jesus before the cross. And they happened thick and fast there toward the last. Now we have the events in chapter 27 that surround the crucifixion of Christ. The Sanhedrin delivers Jesus to Pilate. And you have the repentance of Judas and the trial before Pilate, the release of Barabbas, the crucifixion, death and burial of Jesus, and the tomb seal and a watch set. Now we've come to the central fact of the gospel message. Paul says to the Corinthians, I delivered unto you the gospel. What is it? That Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. We've come now to the record of that event. Now, actually, Matthew does not give a record of the actual crucifixion. In fact, no gospel writer does that. They merely tell what went on around the cross. Now, I know that there are those that can depict in graphic terms of how the nails were driven into the quivering flesh and the blood spurted out? Oh, yes, but that's not in the Bible, friends. It's as it were the Spirit of God put the mantle over it, and God spread the mantle of night down over the last three hours of his crucifixion and says, this is something you cannot look at. It's beyond human comprehension, and the suffering cannot be fathomed, and it was a transaction between the Father in heaven and the Son on the cross. And that cross became an altar on which the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world was offered. And all Matthew says here, and they crucified him. We'll see that when we come to it in just a few moments. Now will you notice, I begin reading at verse 1, and we have here now the Sanhedrin delivers Jesus to Pilate. You remember they arrested him, tried him at night, which was contrary to the law, and the high priest ran his clothes. That was contrary to the Mosaic law. And not only that, but we find that they played a game with him. They buffeted him. They smote him with the palms of their hands. That was a Roman game. The Roman soldiers, when a prisoner is to be put to death, why, they could do with him as they pleased. And they played a game called hot hand. They would show the prisoner the hands of each one of the soldiers of the guard. Then they'd blindfold him. And then they would really punch him. I mean, take the palms of their hands 
And then after that, they'd take the blindfold off and he'd have to pick out the one hand that didn't hit him. And as you well can understand, he'd never guess the right hand, even if he did guess it. I think that they beat the face of the Lord Jesus into a pulp. Read the 53rd of Isaiah again, that he was marred more than any man. They made him look absolutely not like a human being. They had beat him so. Then they ridiculed him as a prophet. They said, prophesy unto us. Who smote you? Ridiculing him there. And then Peter comes and we have him denying the Lord. Now in chapter 27, I read, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Now they formulated a charge that as they're taking it now to the Supreme Court, they must have a case that will stand up before the Roman court. Verse 2, and when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Now, you see, the Lord was there when they were leading him through that hall to take him to deliver him to Pilate. Why, here comes Judas. Why didn't he turn to the Lord Jesus and ask for forgiveness? But he didn't. What he said was, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? See thou to that. In other words, you've chickened out. You're yellow. You did the job and it's over with and we have no need of you any further. We have the one that we were after. We paid you off. And what happened? Verse 5, he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. This man now, he leaves the temple area and goes out and hangs himself. He could have turned to the Lord Jesus and been forgiven. Verse 6, and the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it's not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it's the price of blood. How pious they are. You see, we can't use it in the treasury. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. And all this was done, by the way, will you notice, wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value. And that you'll find in Jeremiah in the 18th chapter, the first four verses, and again in Zechariah, the 11th chapter of 12 and 13. And they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor. You see, he was there. And on the way to die, even for Judas, our Lord had given him his opportunity. Wherefore, friend, art thou come? And even at this 11th hour, he could have turned to the Lord Jesus and he could have been forgiven. Now, will you notice verse 11? And Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest, you are right. You see, the charge that they made was they wanted to get rid of him because of blasphemy. That is, that's what they accused him of. Why, he said, Henceforth you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. That to them was blasphemy. And on that charge, they would have crucified him, or at least stoned him to death, but they couldn't do it. So they now deliver him to Pilate, but they have to have a charge that will stick in a Roman court. And treason would be one, and this would be it. Here's one that claims to be the king of the Jews, and Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. In other words, are you saying this yourself? Actually, you're right. You're saying it. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Now, you see, they wanted to make certain false charges against him, and as they did, our Lord didn't even take the time to answer him. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. He's the lamb, you see, led before Shiraz is dumb. 
Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Now the byplay that took place, John will go into detail, and the other gospel writers will add a great deal to this, but Matthew only gives the bare facts, you see. He just says that this was the charge that was made, and this was no basis on which to crucify him, actually, because he had not incited a rebellion. There had been others that had, but the Lord Jesus had not. So he hit upon a very happy solution to the problem. He wanted to please these religious leaders uh, in order that there might be peace in Jerusalem, but he also felt like that he couldn't just sentence him arbitrarily to death, that is, the Lord Jesus. And he hit upon the fact that he had there a very notable prisoner, which means he's a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And he was guilty of about everything, murder, robbery, treason, the whole bit, by the way. Verse 17, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ. Now, he thought that this crowd would certainly ask for the Lord Jesus. The contrast was so evident, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Pilate, he was a clever politician. He could see what was taking place there. He was sure that he had an airtight case now, and they had asked for Barabbas to be crucified and Jesus to be released, and that would give him a very happy out to this situation. But it's not going to be that easy. But now verse 19, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Now, somebody says, how do you explain that? Well, very easily. She's as superstitious as she possibly can be. Maybe tied up in one of the mystery religions. This sort of thing could have been satanic very, very easily. And I'm sure that that's the background of it. I don't think God gave her this warning at all. But here is a woman that should have said, well, if he's a just man and dying, she should have investigated, found out more, got more information but she didn't, you see, just superstitious, have nothing to do with him. Now, we find here in verse 20, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. You see, the religious rulers circulated among the crowd. They are clever politicians themselves. And they said, now the thing to do is to ask that Barabbas be delivered and to destroy Jesus. And the governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. And this man Pilate, here he's taken aback for a moment. He never dreamed they would stoop to do a thing like this. But he didn't know how low religion could stoop. Verse 22, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And friends, why should he ask the crowd for the decision? He's the judge. He should have made the decision. Now, we'll find out in the other Gospels, especially John. John tells us how many times that Pilate called him back on the inside. And what he's really saying to the Lord Jesus, if you will cooperate with me, I can get you out of this, and he'll get me off of a hot seat that I'd like to be off of. Actually, when you read this in all the four Gospels, you find out that Jesus is really not on trial, but Pilate is. He had to make a decision relative to Jesus Christ. Our Lord's not trying to escape at all. And so he asks the crowd, imagine a Roman judge asking the crowd, what will I do then with Jesus? And I tell you, it came back to him. It was flung in his face. They all say unto him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But a mob never has a reason, but they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Now he called for a basin, washed his hands, 
said he'd have nothing to do with it. But it's not that easy, you see. He had to make a decision. Every man does. What think ye of Christ is the test to try both your state and your station. You can't be right in the rest until you think rightly of him. What do you think of Christ? That's the important one. And he tried to wash his hands. But the bitter irony is that the oldest creed that the church has has this statement, crucified under Pontius Pilate. He didn't really wash his hands of this deed. The blood of Jesus was on his hands. Verse 25, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. And unfortunately, that has been true and can be demonstrated. Verse 26, then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, Pilate's willing to stoop this low himself. He had to make a decision, and his decision, of course, is one of rejection. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And now they'll do with him as they please. They'll ridicule him. He becomes a plaything for this brutal, cruel crowd. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. May I say to you, this is frightful that they did. They spit upon him. This had happened before. They took the reed and smote him on the head. I believe that he was beaten into a pulp. Friends, he was marred more than any man, is the way Isaiah describes it in the 53rd chapter. Now, verse 31 here, and after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come into a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, and I believe that that place is Gordon's Calvary, by the way. I looked around when I was there. I'm sure that after all these years and the things that happened to Jerusalem, it's difficult to make a judgment. I'm sure that if you have to make a choice between the two places that have been chosen, then it would be Gordon's Calvary. It is a place of a skull. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingle with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. You see, that's in fulfillment of prophecy. Psalm 69, 21. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. So that all this is happening according to the fulfillment of prophecy. And sitting down, they watched him there. And I think that here you see humanity that has reached the very lowest depth. I don't think you need to go to Skid Row. You don't need to look at the dope fiends. You do not need to go to a prison and look at some criminal. If you want to see mankind that's reached the lowest, here it is. And sitting down, they watched him there. And I believe in that crowd was Saul of Tarsus. Later on, he called himself the chief of sinners. Now, the reason he called himself the chief of sinners was because that's what he was, the chief of sinners. And sitting down, they watched him there. And they set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple, buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross." My friend, if he's the Son of God, he won't come down from the cross. He didn't have to prove anything at this point. He's now dying for the sins of the world. If thou be the Son of God, they raise the doubt. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him 
with the scribes and elders. Now, you think that that pack of bloodhounds, after they got him on the cross, would go home and let him die in peace, but they didn't. You see, they stayed there till the last minute. Verse 42, he saved others himself. He cannot save. And that's the truest statement that they ever made. That is a true statement. He saved others himself. He cannot save. If he's to save you and me, he had to die on the cross. If he came down from that cross, you and I'll have to go up. We'd have to be executed for our sins. We deserve it. We're hell doom sinners. And he took our place there, not only Barabbas' place, but yours and mine. I wonder sometimes if Barabbas didn't get saved somewhere along the line. Well, there was a thief that did. Now, he saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Would they have believed him? I don't think so. But he didn't come down because he's taking your place and mine. Verse 43, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The crowd understood that he claimed deity, you see. Verse 44, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. See, both of the thieves at first did that. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Now we have here this three hours of darkness. You see, he was put on the cross at the third hour at nine in the morning. Man did all he could. Then at the noon hour, darkness came down, and then that cross became an altar on which the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world was offered. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the answer to that is, if you read Psalm 22, it opens with this statement. It says, Because thou art holy. When my sin was put upon him, God had to withdraw. He had to be executed if he's going to take my sin and yours. Verse 47 some of them that stood there when they had heard that said, This man call it for Elias. And straightway one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. Why? Well, to fulfill prophecy. The rest said, Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, notice how he died. He yielded up the ghost. He went willingly. The death rattle, and every person has it, is when they gasp for that last breath. We want it so badly. He dismissed his spirit. We'll leave off, friends, right at that very serious spot today. We'll pick up there next time, and we expect to conclude the Gospel of Matthew next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. This is the most sorrowful and one of the most important moments in history. The moment Jesus accomplished what he came to earth to do, to die for our sins, and he did so willingly. We'll complete our study in Matthew tomorrow, and on Thursday the Bible bus returns to the Old Testament to the book of Exodus. If you don't already have a copy of our free digital book, Briefing the Bible, that contains all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for Exodus and our entire five-year study of God's Word, Download it today at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can send you an abbreviated copy by mail. And while the Bible bus moves along, we invite you to spend more time in Matthew on your own. Don't forget that you can listen again anytime at ttb.org or through our latest app. Another great way to continue to study, again, is by downloading the free Bible companion to Matthew. This is a new resource that we have available. It's got a quick overview of Dr. McGee's teaching and then a link to the section of the Bible that we're studying and some great discussion questions to help stir your thinking and help you to go deeper. Check it out, and maybe even send the link to a friend. It's an easy introduction to the Bible bus and God's Word. Again, the Bible Companion and so many other free Bible study resources can be found at ttb.org. But be careful. You might find yourself spending hours looking through our virtual bookshelves. (laughs) You know, sometimes I'll go to download just one quick item, and I find myself spending 
a whole bunch of time enjoying all the great booklets and messages and other materials available, and I download them so I've got them for future reference on my iPad, and it can quickly become a terrific but yet time-consuming habit. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'll meet you here tomorrow for our final study in Matthew. God bless you today as you walk with Him. Our study on the Bible bus today is just one step in a five-year journey through the entire Word of God. Come along for the ride, and you'll study both the Old Testament and New Testament, discovering God's great redemption story. Is this your story, too?